Welcome to the Core Women Podcast, the place for women entrepreneurs, authors, and self-starters looking to build community and gain valuable insights through expert interviews with women at the top of their game. Join your host, podcaster, producer, expert coach, entrepreneur, and author, Dr. Summer Watson, as she aims to inspire and empower you through these candid conversations. Lean in and embrace the journey. It's time to start the show. Here's your host, Dr. Summer Watson. Today on the show, I would like to welcome Don Churchill, who is a published author and podcast speaker, is the founder of Be Made Whole, a coaching program specializing in trauma recovery for women who've endured sexual assault and narcissistic abuse. Dawn has experienced her own transformation and recovery after a history from nine years old of forced childhood enslavement, sex trafficking, satanic ritualistic abuse, and occult brainwashing. She is here to talk about how to dismantle trauma blocks and live empowered lives of purpose and prosperity. Dawn is a trauma-informed coach as well as a dance educator and dance fitness instructor around the world. We have a great deal to talk about today, so let's dive right in and welcome Dawn. Thank you so very much, Dr. Summer. I appreciate your time today. It is a pleasure to be here with you, talking to you. We have so much to chat about, so let's jump right into this. But before we jump into the aspects of your professional life, if you could describe your journey in one word to this point, what would that word be and why? Revelatory. (laughs) Ooh, that's a good one. It has been the revelation of lies that I have believed that came in through the door of trauma that I believed most of my adult life the revelation of those lies, the uprooting and evicting of those things out of my mind, will, and emotions that has brought not only peace and joy, but has brought healing. So revelation would have to be the word. Wow. I don't think I've ever had that word. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that Mm -hmm. word. And thank you for the why. Can you share your journey of transformation and recovery and how it led you to create Be Made whole, because there's so much in your story. There's so much transformation. There's so much that you've actually experienced throughout your life that I'd like you to talk more about that, that transformation, what you call recovery or how you've worked through this and then how it led you to create something meaningful, be made whole. Basically, it started as a personal search for my 20s, 30s, and into my early 40s. I had tried many different forms of recovery or therapy. So I did talk therapy for many years of my adult life. I took anti-anxiety and antidepressant medication. There were seasons of my life as an adult where I had experienced debilitating depression to the point of suicidal tendencies. I also experienced very typical for people that have had severe past trauma addiction issues. So like sometimes I drank too much. I definitely ate too much. I relied on sugar as a source of comfort. Um, you know, just lots of different things. That's very typical to somebody that has unhealed heart wounds, that unhealed pain that is in the soul is constantly crying out for some sort of soothing or healing. And so in our own humanity, we try to accommodate it or soothe it with something that will suffice it for the moment. It could be shopping or sex, anything that's going to give you a dopamine fix, basically. And so I had tried several different counselors and support groups, but nothing was really, nothing was hitting the nail on the head. And one day I was taking a walk and I didn't care that people were, you know, in the neighborhood. And I screamed up at the heavens, I will never be depressed another day in my life. It was as if that moment in time, I just decided I was done with depression because I'd had the roller coaster of depression and anxiety most of my adult life. By the way, this was about 10 or 12 years ago. And so that decision led me to, I would say, just a personal journey of understanding how our thoughts affect our core belief system, our our will, our emotions. And so what I really learned through study and through personal revelation was that 
I learned how to rewire my mind or rewire my brain with mindset, fortification, development, rewiring, that sort of thing. And a lot of it, I did use my Bible as the text, you know what I mean? And I really do feel that it is my relationship with God that has spurred this. But I have had to put in a lot of hours of work ethic on my own. As I went through that process of learning the tenets of mindset development and rewiring, I actually started a life coaching business that I had not intended to begin. And I was really just teaching my clients those processes that I had discovered. But I found that I was still being constantly dragged back into past trauma, so to speak. The emotional aspect of it and the woundedness of it, or even the helplessness or the hopelessness of it, or you know what have you. But there was a certain point in time where, and I will say that this was from God, I felt like he asked me, to ask him to reveal all hidden woundedness in me. So there were many aspects of my childhood trauma story that I had not remembered. I had remembered all of the verbal abuse, all the manipulation, the criticism. I had remembered most of the beatings. I remembered most of the physical and mental and emotional cruelty. By and large, I had not remembered most of the sexual abuse and the trafficking and the slavery. Now, I won't say that I hadn't remembered any of it because as an adult, there were certain flashbacks that I would get And every time I got them, I dismissed them. I thought my mind was just playing tricks on me. Mm. Once I began to speak a declaration over myself, it sounded something like I decree and declare that I now have remembered all hidden trauma, all hidden woundedness. I kept saying that for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden it was like the floodgates opened and I began to remember everything. Mm. One of the things that I remembered as a little girl, every night that I was molested, I vowed to myself, I made a declaration. We have no idea the power of our own words over our own life. I made a declaration to myself, whatever had happened, that I would forget it by morning time. And I kept saying that throughout those years that I would forget what they had done to me. When you give yourself a command, your subconscious mind receives it as a command. And that was one of the ways that all of those memories were locked up. And as I began to speak forth that I now remembered all hidden trauma, it was like, (laughs) so I began to remember everything. And of course, I experienced some significant PTSD because my mind and my body was now remembering everything. I will say that there had been clues in the past, you know, as an adult, uh, when I lived in Illinois, they all have basements. And so when I would go down into a basement, that's usually where the family room or the game room was, I would start to have a panic attack, but I had no idea why. Mm-hmm. Well, the basement is where I was abused in my childhood home. There were some clues throughout adulthood of the trauma that was kind of locked up in my subconscious mind. I began to remember everything. And so as I began to remember everything, I had to start dealing with some of those significant moments in time. It was addressing the emotional woundedness, the pain, you know, the the sense of abandonment and betrayal, uh, you know, all of those things. It was through that process that I discovered that not only renewing your mind and redeveloping your mind and your belief systems and your core belief systems, But it was this thing of bitterness and anger and rage that I was having a hard time moving through. And the truth of the matter is, until you can evict anger, rage, and bitterness and unforgiveness, like at a cellular level, until you can really get rid of that, like once and for good, even a normal person that hasn't experienced significant trauma, they will have triggered moments of anger that can lead to rage because there are things that have happened in the past that made them angry, that are not yet resolved, but they've decided to get over it and move on. But those moments are not resolved. And so now when something happens in the present that feels or looks similar to those previous moments, there is a trigger. They usually have at least an internal reaction that is exceedingly far beyond what's really happening in the present. So I learned that I had to be able to forgive each and every person that had significantly wounded me, which included my mother, my stepfather, all of the men that they sold me to, all of the men that I'd had relationships with as an adult, you know, that had treated me poorly. I went through about a two to a two and a half year time period of it took that long for me to work through the list of everyone that had significantly wounded me. In that process, I also learned that there were things that I needed to forgive me for. There are things that I had accepted responsibility or blame for that wasn't really my fault. 
like, you know, maybe I'd failed to achieve this degree and I was still angry with myself about it or what have you. Anyway, I went through a process of self-forgiveness. There was even some layers of forgiving God, because sometimes we blame God for the horrible things that other people have done to us, like God allowed it to happen. And the truth of the matter is God doesn't force us to choose anything. And when I say this, I say this with all love and forgiveness towards my mother. My mother was a very, very broken person, and she had a crap ton of unhealed trauma that had never been addressed. And so in her heart, there was bitterness and rage that had nothing to do with me. I didn't cause it, but I was the whipping post, so to speak. I understand that now. I didn't understand that as a little girl. And so there was a part of me that was angry with God for allowing me to be born to such an abusive mother. And when I finally understood that my mother made those choices of her own volition, I also understand that those choices were very much fueled by her anger and bitterness. But my mom chose to make those decisions. God didn't allow her to make those decisions. She's responsible for those decisions. So through the process of learning how to forgive at what I call at a cellular level, once you are able to forgive and release something or someone completely, the toxicity of the venom of unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and rage leaves you. And it has an amazing effect on the body. The body can now heal itself. We carry illnesses in our body that are related to anxiety or anger or bitterness or what have you. And so after I learned how to walk through that process of learning how to forgive anybody and everybody, including myself and God, I really began seeking a process of kind of putting everything back together, healing the woundedness that was still there. Even though I had forgiven, there was still some pain and some grief and some sorrow. And so learning how to receive healing in those areas And really, for lack of better words, put myself back together. I don't know how old you are, but if you remember the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, he had a big fall, and then they put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I feel like it has been that process of putting myself back together, of putting back together all of the pieces of my heart, of my mind, of my will. At the end of the day, what the total end result is, is a restoration of identity because it is your identity that is stolen through significant trauma. So as I'm going through these whole processes, I kept feeling like God asked me to record what I was learning, what I was processing. The recording of that, you know, me scribing it, it became the content for my coaching program. Well, thank you so much, Dawn, for going through that process, describing where you started and what you went through to develop that recognition of that trauma, unlayering that trauma, what it felt like. You've mentioned so many things that do correlate with not just talk therapy, but therapy. So where's the line between the coaching and the therapy? So I am not a licensed clinician um, therapist, and I don't present myself as such, although I do believe that there is great value in clinical therapy. I also believe that it is, to some degree, can be lacking because sometimes, well, it just depends on the therapist and what methods that they use. But a lot of times they're able to give their clients coping mechanisms, but not really resolve the trauma completely to where those moments in time are now completely resolved, completely healed, and no longer affecting that person's present day or their future. So I'm not saying that I don't think that there's value in it. I just feel that sometimes it can lack a true resolution that is necessary. Now, because of that, I don't bill myself as a therapist. I'm not. I really consider myself to be an educator because what I'm really teaching people how to do is discern their trauma and then learning the steps and the processes that are needed to heal it It's really their responsibility to walk it out. And I really just mentor them along the way. Well, I love that. Thank you so much for answering that question because there is so much here that you unlayer. And when you're working with people who own trauma, there's going to be unlayering. You're going to get into some deep stuff. You're going to be triggering folks. What do you do when you trigger these folks and they start you know, falling out, or they start decompensating to a certain degree. And you're like, whoa, okay, I triggered something. So now here we are having to work through this. And of course, wanting to work through this. And I think a lot of times we bring in our own personal experiences, where you're walking along and you yell out to the sky, I'm done. I'm done with anxiety. 
I'm done with depression and getting to that point where you're really healing at, like you said, the cellular level, what that looked like for you, what that more importantly felt like for you, felt like for you, because there are modalities and unfortunately there's some good ones and there's some ones that help this person or that person, but not maybe everybody. So you've created a structure where you're educating people to really tap into that trauma understand it, be able to name it, be able to unfold it. Because I think a lot of times, as you said, that anger that's laying under the surface, that's getting ready to kind of explode like a volcano. It's because maybe people don't even recognize, as you didn't for years, that this is what happened to me. You blocked it out. You told yourself, when I wake up in the morning, I'm not going to remember this. When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to live a life that I want to live. It's not going to be owned or manipulated by somebody else. So you were trying to actually retain some semblance of normalcy for yourself. I was trying to, yes. Trying to. But when those core beliefs are locked up in your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind is what navigates your entire life. So you don't even realize that that is the autopilot that is driving the bus of your life. And so no matter what you think in the forefront, if this isn't dealt with the underlying stuff, you're going to end up up in self-sabotage all the time. I mean, I think we can get into just a conversation about values and even let's say people who haven't experienced the trauma that maybe you, I, or somebody else has, It takes a while to understand what your own beliefs are because of all the conditioning and all the things that have been told, taught, modeled for you over the years. So how did you actually depart from all those traumatic lessons that have gotten into your subconscious at this time? How did you even recognize that? Was there anybody to even come in and say, I need to save this young girl. I need to help her. Anybody there for you? As a child, no, but you have to understand, I underwent years of witchcraft programming and brainwashing. I was so in agreement with the belief that if I told anybody that they were going to kill my father in front of me, and then they were going to kill me in a specific way, Mm. they had me completely snowballed. Mm. That is tough, man. And that is heartbreaking. That's how deep it goes from what is around us, how malleable what sponges we are in regards to what we see every day, what we're told. And so how do you know differently if you're not exposed to something different? So how did you recognize that? Again, I think this was just something that I felt like the Lord said to me, because watch what comes out of your mouth whenever you're under pressure. I'm like, what? And so I noticed that whenever I was under pressure, if I was feeling anxious or just whatever it might be, So let's say that you have some unexpected financial bills that you didn't expect. And I don't know, maybe you haven't prepared for it financially. What comes out of your mouth under financial pressure are your true core belief systems. So if you say something like every single time I get hit with an unexpected bill, I don't know where it's going to come from. That right there is a core belief that you don't know where it's going to come from. You don't know how you're going to meet that need. So anytime that you find yourself under emotional stress or duress, What comes out of your mouth is what you believe. I'll give you another example. Every time I would have a breakup with a guy, a male-female relationship, what would come out of my mouth was, well, I guess it's all my fault. I guess he's not to blame it. I'm sorry. I'm the whole neck roll. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. For those of you who can't see us, we're doing the neck neck thing. (laughs) But I would say, well, I guess he's not to blame. I guess he's perfect. I guess it's all my fault. And I guess I'm nothing but a cheap piece of, and I won't use the word. Yeah. That came out of my mouth at every single breakup. I began to examine, Dawn, why are you saying that? I said that because that's what I truly believed about myself. Well, where did that belief came from? That belief came from me being sex trafficked for many years of my childhood life, being told and treated as if I was nothing more than a piece of you know what, literally being told that that's what I was worth and that it was all my fault. So if you will examine the things that you say under stress, it will give you a clue as to where your negative core beliefs are. Yeah. I also think that as you're explaining this, just from a different perspective too, I think that 
you know, as we develop our core beliefs, it is based on our experiences. It is based on what has been told. And it is based on what we're seeing around us. And sometimes pushing back on those beliefs can be really hard because people are going to attack you and say, well, no, that's not how it's done. Or no, you're doing it our way. But as you're describing regarding all or nothing, so Mm -hmm. ah, this is always going to happen to me. I'm always going to get this bill or I always get these kind of men. That's catastrophizing. That's all or nothing. That's that. It's lack of self-worth. It's the messages, right? The messages and the messages come from somewhere. The messages come from modeling. The messages come from that conditioning. The messages come regarding your lack of self-worth from what you've been told, how you've been treated for years and years and years. And you were under this belief system that was ingrained in you. Yes. So you were incredible in regards to how you did that detour. How did you take the detour? And you said it was that inner knowing that it was that voice that said, question this, listen to what's coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for describing that. And I know there's so much here we could talk about, but I have a few more questions. Let me get to my next question. What are some of the most common trauma blocks you encounter with your clients and what strategies do you use to help dismantle them? Most of the time, they don't really understand why they feel what they feel. So for instance, if they're struggling with anger, they don't really know why they're angry. And usually they will then assume that it is the people around them, the circumstances around them. Part of it is just, you know, the bitterness that's still in their heart from things that they have experienced that they haven't released. So nine times out of 10, it is their inability to discern why they are struggling with anxiety, why they are struggling with anger, why they are struggling with sorrow, grief, and depression. And what I do is really just through asking a bunch of questions, I begin to kind of pull back the layers and we're able to pinpoint it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And I like that strategy because you're really getting into more of opening the door and having those people being able to recognize and name what they're feeling. And I believe that we were taught growing up, I'm 55 even in songs, in movies, and all these different things, not just in our homes, but it'll be okay. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. These are the messages. So we departed from, how are you actually feeling? What is that called? Is that called anger? Oh, that's what I'm feeling. Aha. Okay. I got it. That's sadness. That's anger. Now I can put a name to it. Now I can identify it with a feeling. Now I can understand where it's culminating into and what it's looking like. And that it is there under that surface and that it's okay. It's okay to have those feelings, but are you responding or reacting in anger or depression or anxiety? And the response is very different than the reaction. And that's where you get the catastrophizing. That's where you get the all or nothing thinking. That's where you get a lot of these behaviors. So as we move into the interview, I'd like to ask you, how do you integrate your movement and dance or do you use movement and dance in your trauma recovery work? I'm in the process of creating my own choreographed somatic movement, if that makes Mm. sense. It's not ready for the public yet. We're working on it. Let's say that. And so trauma gets stuck in your body as well as in your mind and emotions. Now, one of the fallacies of somatic movement is that if you can move it out of the body, then you're good. But the problem is, is if there's still a root of it in your mind and emotions, it's just going to build back up again. You know, it's like a pressure cooker. So you have to deal with the soul part, the mind and emotions, you have to root the anger out of there. But I will say, so when you get triggered, either in fight or flight, either in anger or fear, there is a lot of stored trauma that you'll then feel in your body and getting it out of your body or at least getting a release from it temporarily is really helpful. I actually became a fitness instructor when I first started going through this process 12 or 15 years ago. And I found that regular exercise, I wasn't even really doing it to lose weight. I was doing it to get the release of all of this stored trauma that was coming to the surface. Through that, I did learn that movement and dance does help a lot. And so I simply suggest for my clients to exercise and to move their body. I haven't finished the choreography process of the somatic movement, so it's not ready for the public yet. Okay. Well, I love the idea. I think it's beautiful because as we move our bodies, 
you know this as well as I do, as we move our bodies, we create dopamine and serotonin. That again, when we talk about the cellular structure, when we're talking about our neurons and we're talking about what we produce in our body, that's good stuff. Absolutely amazing stuff. That's amazing stuff. So that's our natural ability to be able to reduce the angst and the depression in our bodies. I'm not saying that we don't need medication because there is a need, there's a reason for it, but exercise also helps in many cases and many studies they have shown that is also very helpful in reducing depression and anxiety. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for you to bring in those nuances between your coaching and dance, Mm -hmm. I love it, especially since you have that training and you've taught dance around the world, correct? Yes, I have. Well, I've been really blessed to do that, but yes. (laughs) How exciting. Well, you know, Don, we've talked about so much. We could sit here and go really deep and and I would love that. And yet maybe we'll have to have a part two to talk more because I know your story's evolving. I know there's more for you to come, like you're potentially combining dance and coaching, which would be amazing. You know, so when you do come back and say, hey, Summer, I'm ready to talk about this new program because I think that's very exciting. Still, you have many different programs. You've got one or two books. My second and third book are in process. My first book was published, gosh, in 2016. It was really my weight loss story that happened as a result of trauma healing. Once I started addressing the trauma issues, then I started addressing my sugar issues and how I would binge eat. Yeah, that was my first book. And so I have two others that are in progress, one that will be released this year in 2024. Mm. Well, you've got so much going on. You've got so much to offer. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My last question is, as we come to the close of the interview, what advice would you give to someone currently struggling with trauma who feels trapped and unable to move forward? Two things. Number one, they need to start asking themselves a lot of questions. Why do I respond that way? Why do I think that way? Why do I act that way? Just begin to ask themselves a lot of questions. But the one thing that will help them get out of the stuck mode, and that is the idea of possibility. There was a time in my life where once I started remembering everything, I was of the mindset that there's no way this will ever be healed. There's no way I will ever be set free from this garbage, right? And that's a very much of a a concrete belief system. And so what I started saying to myself was, I may not be completely healed from it today, but it is possible. It is absolutely possible at some point in time for me to be completely healed from all of this garbage, right? If you can get someone to see the fact that it's possible and begin to say it's possible, it opens the door for them to be able to walk through doors of possibility to healing and wholeness. Mm. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for those words of wisdom. And thank you, Dawn, for joining me on the Core Women podcast today. Thank you so much, Dr. Summer. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. You can follow Dawn Churchill on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram at Be Made Whole Inc. and on LinkedIn and YouTube at Dawn Churchill and at DawnChurchill.org, DawnChurchillInstitute.com and love, that's L-U-V, Radio Network dot com. Thank you for joining us on the Core Women Podcast with Dr. Summer Watson. We're so glad you're here and would love to connect more with you. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Core Women and on Twitter at Core Women One. For more about Core Women and Dr. Watson, visit corewomen.com. Want more support and resources for amazing women like you? Great! Join Dr. Watson and Jen Fontanilla at the Life, Love & Money Collective, a core women production that aids in understanding the key traits that might be getting in the way of living a life that you are absolutely passionate about. Connect with Summer and Jen and find out more at thelifeloveandmoney.com.